puppy. Ooh, it should just happen. Give the puppy a pop up in a sec. Ha ha. Cool, so I'm gonna get started. Uh, my name is Sharon Biswas, can everyone see? Yes, great. So my name is Sharon Biswas, and I'm gonna talk about queer community building through LARP uh, with case studies on Just Little Loving and Beat Generation. Um, just a quick thing about who I am. Um, I have shown work or made games for a number of different museums and galleries. I've taught classes or lectures at different like academic programs. I write a lot for publications, I have an upcoming article in First Person Scholar, and I've won a couple of awards, including Indicate, which you heard a little bit about just now. Um, these are some of the games that I have that you can actually like purchase. The first two um, you can get on my Itch page, and the, la the last one you get on like, Amazon, that's a board game. Uh, I also make a lot of weird, interactive, immersive theatery things, and you cannot do that ever, so sorry for your loss. Um, and today we're going to talk about how LARP can promote community building with a specific emphasis on queer community building. So this is a photo of me in a LARP in a bathtub. I'll talk about that more later. Um, the two case studies I'm going to use are Just Little Loving, which is a Swedish LARP whose US run I went to in 2017 by TK Edlund and Hanne Grasmo, um, and Beat Generation, which is an American freeform LARP um, run by Maury Brown, um, uh, written by Maury Brown, uh, in 2018. And Just as Loving was held in the woods of Minnesota, and Beat Generation was held in an apartment in the West Village. Now, before we start, um, this idea of networks of effective entanglement that Cole Worley brings up, I think is really important. So for him, he says the important lens with which to view a game is not, an, an analog game specifically, but is not this system of processes and system of rules that we tend to think about, but it's a network of emotions and how people can relate to each other. I would argue that freeform LARPs use human relationships as the base unit of the game, right? And we're going to go into that a little bit and talk about how these human relationships can be enhanced, amplified, modified, and changed, which mean the same thing, sorry, um, in order to create feelings of community, especially when tied to queerness. So we're going to start with talking about character immersion and group play. So in LARP, the point is you are going to play a character and you play with each other. And here Marcus Montella says the LARPer is the primary audience of her own performance and the diegesis she builds is her primary object of appreciation. So I am acting out, I'm embodying a character and that performance is meant in part mainly for me. Right? And so here, this becomes something really interesting because when you talk about characters in a narrative, be it like a novel or a film or play, characters in narratives tend to be stand-ins for larger themes or processes or motifs, right? And so here, in a LARP, if, if we take that to be true, in a LARP, every person in the game is at once um, a stand-in for a motif, a vehicle through which the motif is being transmitted, 
and the consumer observer of that motif. It becomes this weird spiraling like thing about I am the idea I am embodying and I'm watching myself embody that idea, which is kind of bizarre. And it leads to this phenomenon that's well known in LARP called bleed, right? Bleed is when the emotions, thoughts, and feelings of a character and a player intermingle, right? So quick question, which of this is the real me? Right? So, at one side, I'm playing Chain, who is a leather porn star prostitute in Just a Little Loving. Some of that leather is mine, thank you. Um, and on the other side, that is my uh, new headshot for my corporate consulting job. Right? In which I look really dashing. Um, so, bleed is when these two commingle. And it's unavoidable because in the game I'm playing a character but I'm still me, right? And these, this complex spiraling that I just talked about tends to lead to this bleed. And a lot of people play in order to achieve bleed, right? So that the emotions and, and things that they go through in the game they can take back into their lives. There's a, a idea called emancipatory bleed that's put forth by Jonea Kemper. Um, I don't know exactly where she put it. She's talked about it in a lot of different places, so just by her. Um, and that where she talks about this idea of bleed to uplift yourself from oppressive forces and systems. So LARP, through bleed, and if considered with the right themes, characters, and other techniques I'll talk about, can cause emancipatory bleed. And that's where the queer part um, really comes in. Um, and this community part comes in more importantly because... Um, there's a lot of theory, so Mike Pujola, whose name I can't pronounce, so I hope it's Pujola, so if he's listening, which he isn't, I'm sorry, um, talks about this idea of inter-immersion, right, where in a LARP, you cannot be fully immersed without another person there helping you be immersed. Um, there are, there's a lot of talk about one-player LARPs, and that's a different conversation, I have written one, but um, Pujola talks about this idea of we help each other place ourselves in the narrative and the time and the place that the LARP is set in. And that's later idea of Cole Worley, the person who I cited earlier, talks about this idea of networks of dependence, where to get emotional affect, we must have dependence on each other, right? You, like if I don't depend, his argument is that if I don't depend on you, emotions aren't gonna be that strong between us. <laughs> And so that's why I have this lovely image of people supporting each other. Um, and so you can take, you can think of that as so complex emotions such as emancipatory bleed can only exist if you have complex interrelations such as the ones that happen within these networks of dependence. And so these two LARPs and LARPs in general can leverage both of that can leverage interdependence, the community part, to create complex emotions, the queer part, and you can argue that the interdependence, the community, is caused because we have complex emotions, which is the queer part, right? So there they like kind of crisscross each other and become this complicated tangle that I'm not qualified to examine that fully, but they work. Um, the next thing we talk about is history, right? So both these LARPs were set in historical settings. That's the real Allen Ginsberg. I just like this photo a lot. Um, so in, in one of them, we were playing the artists and luminaries of the 60s. Um, did I not mention that earlier? Sorry. In Beat Generation, we are playing the artists and luminaries of the 60s. So I played Allen Ginsberg, uh, and we were like painters and poets and things like that. While in Just a Little Loving, we were playing queer people, um, in the 80s during the start of the AIDS crisis, right? So these are both historical settings, and both these LARPs <laughs> demanded a level of um, historical knowledge. They did not demand at all that we be experts in this, but in um, both LARPs, players, I, I wouldn't say that the organizers didn't demand, but like, the feel of the game demanded, right? So for Beat Generation, most players did research into the kind of art their character made, right? I reread Howl, I watched some of the movies about Ginsburg, and I read a bunch of his poems. There's some great ones about like face fucking, which are wonderful. Um, um, and for Just Little Loving, there was a great deal of historical research. Every single day of the LARP, it was a five-day LARP, we actually had readings where we would read parts of like how to survive a plague, and then we had experts come talk to us about the time period and about aid, things like that. So this sense, this 
connection to history was very important. And it wasn't because the aim of the LARP was to make an authentic, accurate experience. It wasn't at all, right? There's the real Allen Ginsberg, and then there's Sharon Biswas playing Allen Ginsberg, right? I couldn't even get the glasses right. Because the point is that reality and truth are distinct experiences, as Elise Vist writes. The point wasn't to be like, I will now know exactly how it feels like to be in the AIDS crisis. That was never the point, right? In fact, that is impossible unless you've actually lived through the AIDS crisis or some weird, horrible thing happened in the future, and let's not talk about that, right? The point was, can we think about the history and connect to the history in order to perhaps understand contemporary phenomena and things going on in our own lives, right? Especially since both these stories uh, were set in near history. We weren't playing like Sumerian queer people, right? We were playing relic, like 20th century things. The themes there were particularly resonant. Many of those themes are still alive today, not just in other parts of the world, but in the United States. In fact, the reason I wanted to sign up for Just the Loving, and at that point I was a freelance artist, I had like no money, and I'm like, really, I'm going to Minnesota? Like, I can afford that. Um, the reason I really wanted to do it was because I wanted a sense of connection with the histories that have allowed me to, to enjoy the freedoms that I have today as a gay man, as a gay brown immigrant in the United States, right? I really want to connect with that. And I think this idea of connecting to one's history is very important in forming any kind of community, right? If you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it, all that jazz. Um, so in that way, this, the fact that these were historical LARPs and not just let's play imaginary queer utopia, which sounds wonderful, and I'd still play that. Um, but the fact that these were historical ops, I think, really added to the idea of communitas um, that came about in the games. Um, now, both games also grappled with the idea of art in a really, really major way. And this is just a random image I found in Unsplash of, like, street dancers um, to illustrate the idea that there's a lot of research that's about how com communal art making is good for creating social relationships. There's a ton of research. I found this like Canadian study because Canada values and funds the arts, and like found like a bajillion like music and dance and painting and blah blah blah, like all kinds of art doing it with other people cement social relationships. I'm not going to talk about that more because you can read about it. Um, but both games involved art making internally, not just pre-game or not just the game itself is art, which it is, but we had instances of art making in the game. So this is me about to take my clothes off um, at a striptease show. I do have photos of what comes next. Find me later. Um, but in Just the Loving, for example, there was a variety show every evening where players, um, sorry, the characters uh, performed. So there were like drag acts and players who had never done drag did drag, for example, right? Um, there were like rock bands, and some of the people in the rock band knew a lot about music, some of them knew nothing about music and just tapped at keyboards randomly, right? Uh, there was strip teaser, there were poetry readings, there was like singing, there was lip syncing, all kinds of art stuff. In Beat Generation, the art making was even more central because the, the diegetic point of why we were there, so the in-story point of why we were there, was that it was a happening in the 60s, and in a happening, you just made art all day long and whenever you wanted, and so people like wrote poems and made sculptures and did performance. The guy who was John Cage went into the bathroom on his own and did this weird silent performance art with this claw-tooth bathtub that we had, the one that I was in in the first slide. Um, and so these instances of art together in character reinforced this idea of where not only are we making art in a LARP, but we are also making art within the LARP together, and we're forming social connections. And much of the art was about queer stuff. There's this bit where I wrote a poem about, like, blowing a straight man or something um, in as Allen Ginsberg and like all the stuff we were making was about like let's talk about being queer and like and like feminism and things like that and the important thing so I just said I I performed like Allen Ginsberg had all these performative poems right so I performed this poem and I am not a good poet by any stretch okay maybe some stretch of the imagination but on the whole I'm not a great poet I write prose and nonfiction, which is prose whatever and drama whatever uh, I write other things not poetry right but this but me 
I was Allen Ginsberg at that moment, so the fact that I'm giving a poem means everyone's going to applaud. And be like, oh my god, that's so wonderful. And yes, that's really cool. Like, oh yeah, I'm getting glowing praise because of my wonderful poetry about cocks in my mouth. Um, yes, this is being recorded. Um, but the, the, the flip side is also true. Like, when I watched other people make art, whether or not it was very good, the game demanded that I appreciate it because their character is known to be a wonderful performer or artist or whatever, right? And so I really got into the mood of, yes, oh my God, this is so good. And this, I, this phenomenon of appreciating art together as a group was actually really bonding. I mean, you know, everyone knows this, right? You watch a movie together, and if it's amazing, well, even if it's terrible, you can bond. But if it's amazing, you can be like, oh, wow, that was so good. And, you know, we form, uh, you know, groups based on shared interests and appreciations, right? Like My Little Pony. Lots of people just come together because they love that show, right? Um, so here we were allowed to do that about our fellow players. And interestingly, at some point when you get very immersed, the, it, it blurs the line between, is this art actually good? Or, or, or are we just appreciating it because it's part of the lot? Not blurred a lot, especially because, and in beat generation, this was more the case. A lot of the stuff we're making were like parody sort of art because, you know, we were trying to be like Dadaist artists or surreal artists who made a lot of bizarre things, uh, who appreciated the fact that their art was hilariously ridiculous, right? So it blurred and it became this wonderful nebulous, uh, this social thing where like, oh, let's make and support art together. This whole idea of inter-immersion came into play again, helping us bond, right? And again, it's about queer arts. We're bonding over this idea of like queerness. Um, and so now it's hard to talk about art without talking about resistance, right? Because historically, a lot of queer art has been about resistance because queer people have been marginalized a lot. Um, so this is from the Stonewall uh, riots. And Mary Flanagan, in her book, uh, Critical Play, her second book, I forget, one of her books, uh, Critical Play, she talks about this idea that games are particularly ripe for subversive practices. Right? And in that chapter, that's specifically about games as systems, because you can push against the rules and systems. But later on, she talks about imaginative play as being really, really interesting to explore rebellion. She has a great example of doll play in the Victorian times. And like, here's a doll, play with it. And the idea was to reinforce societal norms, like this is how you take care of a child and blah, blah, blah. But in fact, research uh, showed that, well, what did children do with dolls? I mean, you've all seen the Adams family. Right, you chop the head off, and like, and like, no, no, this doll is sick, and oh no, you're uh, right, and so this the doll play, imaginative play, became simultaneously the site to transmit societal norms and push back against those societal norms, and this was allowed because this is an imaginative world, right? The game offers an alibi to do things that you wouldn't normally do, and to do things that might be risky in the real world world. And this idea of, of resistance itself is empowering, right? Everyone wants to be able to resist. And sometimes you lack the courage to do in real life. And, and possibly doing the LARP will, in, will start emotions that allow you to be like, wait, I can do this. Even if that doesn't happen, the idea of resistance together, of like coming together for a cause, is very strong for a group group bonding and community building. And a, a particular form of resistance um, is sex, right? Uh, queer sex is inherently political. Lots of different sources and people say that, not just me. Lots of smart people say that. Um, so this is Alex Garner, and in HuffPost he wrote, so his article is called Queer Sex is Our Greatest Act of Resistance. You can argue about greatest, but He's saying that our sex is political power, don't run away from it, wield it. I remember when I was an undergraduate at Dartmouth, uh, we were talking about should we make a new uh, residence hall that's like um, themed on queerness, like it's meant for people who are queer to live. And some people were like, yeah, some people were like, no. And I remember Mike Lebronsky, um, the professor of gender studies, he was talking about, um, I have uh, lots of thoughts about this, but one thing I really like about this is that it gives gay people a place to have sex. 
right? And people are like, oh, well, that's so trite. And, then, and I'm like, well, think about it, though. Is it trite? Like, sexuality is a huge part of humanity, and having a place where a queer person can have sex in his own room without being like, oh, my roommate's going to come in and be disgusted or whatever, is actually very, very powerful. And here, um, the majority, well, I mean, not the majority, a large proportion of the players in both games identified as queer in some way, but many did not, right? And it's interesting because both games had uh, a lot of mechanics to simulate sexuality and sexual acts. So in uh, Beat Generation, you did this abstract hand thing to be like, I'm having sex with you, which is very funny because I thought, at one point I thought people were just holding hands, but they were having sex in game and I just walked in on them having sex. I'm like, oh, well, Allen Ginsberg would do that, so. Um, but in Just Little Loving, because the focus was about, like, AIDS part of it, um, you, the acts were a lot more simulationist. There were bright pink dildos around everywhere that represented the phallus. And, like, if you had to, like, pretend to perform acts on it. In the Swedish version, you actually, like, people would, like, suck on them and things. In the American version, people, like, mimed that. Um, but you like you had to put a condom on it if you were using condom, that kind of thing. And like you would like make like, I made out with so many different guys. Well, I did that anyway. But um, uh, you know, I made out with lots of different guys at that at the in the lot, right? Because the the sex was very simulationist, and one of the points of that was to make you really feel in this era of AIDS that sex is has a lot of weight to it, right? And if you are someone who did not identify as queer, I can only imagine what that might have felt having this like queer sexual experience. Um, well, I can't imagine how that felt, having this queer sexual experience. Like that might be very interesting about your identity. So, um, so resistance and sex in particular are very were very important in both these to create um, bonding and to create relationships and also um, to focus on queerness. And then the final point I'm talking about is ritual, right? So many of you who've studied game design know about this. There's a lot of study and dis discussion about games as rituals. Mary Flanagan talks about a lot about how our earliest games in humanity were sites for ritual process and spiritual practice. So this is Senet from ancient Egypt, and she talks about how um, this is, oh, I didn't cite that. This is an image from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, sorry. Um, and how Senet was probably to do with like spirituality in some way. Uh, and Victor Turner talks about um, rituals as, imp like he talked about rituals creating civilization. Rituals might be said to create society, and that the, the, the civilizing acts that we perform with each other are, are, are born within ritual. And he also says this quote I have up here, in ritual we may catch glimpses of that unused evolutionary potential in mankind which has not yet been externalized. So ritual, same thing about the doll play, the same idea carried forward. Ritual is a place where we learn the, the societal norms, but where we may also create future societal norms that have not yet come to pass. Because So if, if you studied ritual, you talk about the three phases, and the middle phase is the liminal phase, where you're like not in society yet and not part of, not out yet. It's like you're in this transi transitional phase where you're allowed to push against things and create um, what might happen, uh, like potential for change. And so I would say that Victor Turner in these sorts of LARPs might see the seeds of revolution, right? By enacting these, these small acts of resistance, perhaps this creates... Um, change in the future. And so you can think about the entire LARP as a ritual, as many scholars have done. There's a whole article on Just a Little Loving as Ritual up on NordicLARP.org. Um, but you can also talk about the ability in both games for players to enact their own mini rituals, right? So this is a funerary remembrance moment in Just a Little Loving, where we like did a lot of writing and then threw it in the fire and cool things like that. In Beat Generation, I don't have as many photos of that, unfortunately, um, we did a lot of different ritual things. We did this whole baptism ritual where we got shirtless and like baptized ourselves, then stood around and read Howl and then yelled out Moloch, 
um, for one. Uh, there are also smaller things, like it became very common to um, shout the word jizzberg out, which is a portmanteau of jizz, which if you don't know is slang for semen or the act of producing semen. Um, and Berg, which is part of Ginsburg, right? And that became this like rallying cry of positive sexuality um, in the game. Like, people would just start yelling that out when we were talking about sex in a positive way. Um, and, and remember, the, the point of ritual, so people often get um, into this idea of, oh, rituals and magical practice, right? And like conflating them together a lot. Like, oh, I'm doing the ritual because I feel it will have this effect. Most contemporary anthropology about ritual talks about the idea of ritual as meaning-making processes, right? I do this ritual not necessarily because I think doing it will cause something to happen, but because I'm affirming my belief or my desire for something. Yelling Gisberg won't make me magically hard, um, but it's this belief when, yes, we believe in positive sexuality. Um, we are, what did I say? We are enacting ritual together in these two games to affirm solidarity with each other and to the beliefs we had. And the ability to make our own ritual and do those ourselves was very, very powerful. Um, so summary, um, how do you make games that promote um, community, especially queer community? Um, I just like this photo a lot because I look hot in it. Um, so creating, uh, so character embodiment and group plays, think about charactering and immersion that way, talking about emancipatory bleed. Um, think about history and connections you form with history. Think about art and can you, does the creation of art form a role in the game? Uh, and think about resistance, um, because resistance towards oppression can be a powerful unifying force. And think about ritual, the game itself as a ritual and rituals within the game. And I'm going to end on this like hopeful note. Mary Flanagan uh, studies games a lot and says that you can study games just like any other cultural phenomenon, right? Like art or, or laws or whatever from the past. And games uh, give you a sense of what's happening um, in society at that time. And she says, play patterns reflect cultural change. So it's heartening that there's been an increase in analog games and digital games about queerness. There's been an increase in the rise of interactive theater, LARP, and embodied play, which involve lots of people coming together. And so hopefully, to me, this shows that society is A, becoming queerer because homosexual agenda, um, and B, that people are more willing to be close to each other, which is good for everyone. Um, so thank you. That was me, Sharon Viswas. That's my Twitter. That's my website. That's my itch.io. Uh, if you want to read a lot of my writing, all of that's linked on the website. Uh, if you want to chat with me, chat with me. Uh, if you want my sources for this, I can send them to you. If you want to see me stripping later in photographs, I can show you those as well. Thank you and have a nice time.